please join me in welcoming Mr. Bill Adams. Uh, change, especially when you're dealing with private practice. I mean, I've had a lot of healthcare experience, a lot of big companies. This is this endeavor is interesting for me because I have dealt with doctors in operating rooms and various uh, um, other areas in the hospital, but I've never dealt with them in the private practice. So this, for me, has been a very, very big challenge. And what it's like anything else. In the healthcare field, change is like medicine. You know, it tastes really bad when you're going through it, but a lot of times if it's done right, it actually cures a lot of ills. So change is not an easy thing to do, and that's why they call it change. So just be aware that I'm aware that it's not that easy to change, and that this is, this is a, if you will, this is a system that we've developed to help you go through that process. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, <clears throat> how many people here, show of hands, recognize this face? Not very many? How many people here don't recognize this face? This is Stephen Jobs. Anybody here recognize the face now? Does everybody recognize the apple? <laughs> okay. This is a very, very highly uh, regarded individual in the innovation and change area. As a matter of fact, he's one of my top three or four icons in innovation and change. How many have read my white paper? It's on my website. Very good. And it, it's on your thumb drive, so you, you get a chance to read it. This is the cover of it. And what we found out is the private practice is at a crossroads. And there is no question about it that private practice has never been in more difficult and troubled waters. In fact, 94% of the respondents that we talked to chose practice survival over patient care. Now, <clears throat> this doesn't mean that they don't care about patient care. What this means is, many physicians said to us, if I'm not here to care for anybody, what's the difference? Now, 10 years ago, that would have been like committing heresy against the Hippocratic Oath. Today, it is an absolute fact of life. Now, my new poster child for the reluctance to go through change after his speech is Dr. Bush. What a great example. The man says, I'm a clinician, I want to be a clinician, and I don't want to worry about the business. This attitude has been the general attitude that's been perpetrated for eons since the beginning of time. In fact, there's always this aura in the, in the business that the physician just doesn't care about that. They care about the patient, and they care about the, the clinical, and a lot of them care about the research, and they really don't care about the, the actual operating performance. And let's not call it a business, because obviously it's a business. It's really about how we operationally perform. I want to make it through this storm, and I am not going to change. And the changes I do make, they're going to be minor. That's one way to do it. And the waves of change are just going to batter your ship, tear down your sails, and then you're going to hope to get to shore on the other side. Or the third way you can take a look, and I think that's why many, most of you are here, is you're going to change your course. You've got to change your course. And then you're going to adapt to new strategies and new techniques. Because in effect, you wouldn't be here to want to learn, to want to learn, this is not a clinical setting, this is an operation setting, more about are there new ways of looking at running an operation in order for us to survive the, tor the storm of reform? What's causing the storm? So how many here know the Jedi, uh, the, the, that whole movie, the Star Wars. Star Wars? Do we all know the forces? The evil forces. Well, we have evil forces in the storm of reform. 
And they're the ones that are actually causing the storm of reform. They start with the government. They then go to the insurance companies. And finally, we've got the hospitals and health systems. So here you are, ship lost at sea, being battered, and at the same time what they're doing is they're interrupting patient flow coming in the front door because you now have so much competition, you're competing against hospitals and health systems now. You basically are also, and at the same time, you have the payers at the back door saying to you, less and less and less. So they are marginalizing your value. And that erosion is causing a lot of physicians to rethink where they're at in the food chain. <laughs> megatrends. Anyone here ever heard of megatrends? Anyone here ever heard of John Nesbitt? Okay, John Nesbitt, great economist, 25 years ago, wrote a book, Megatrends. I met him, very interesting guy. And let me tell you what megatrends is all about. It's really about what's going on with the forces. His theory was this. The larger countries and organizations get, the more the responsibility, individuals' responsibility, or the more the responsibility is going to be pushed down to the individual. So he predicted 25 years ago that there was a trend, societal trend, that was going on around the globe that the larger everyone got, the more they're going to expect from the individual. And isn't that what we're seeing today in healthcare? So mega trends plays a big part in how this whole dynamics of healthcare is going. Well, let's talk about the progress in healthcare. Well, here's the world we knew. Here's the world Dr. Bush wants to go back to. There were rules, there were commandments. The commandments pulled together the forces, the practice, and the relationship with the patient. So everyone knew the rules. It was an orderly society back then in the days we knew. Now in the storm of reform, this is the world we know. Here's a do-it-yourself kit. Here's a hammer and chisel. Go at it. And how many practices here by a show of hand are finding the dynamics between the forces and the patient getting ever more difficult to manage. Most, everybody, right? That's what's happening. We're being asked to chisel a new set of commandments. And that becomes a very, very difficult thing. Now why? Well, if you really think about it, here's a buddy of mine. He's Bernard. Bernard's about 70 years old. And you see, Bernard's all kind of wired up and he has a couple things hanging off his tush. And he looks like somebody who is in a hospital. And Bernard calls me and says, I got a problem. And I said, what's that? By the way, to his close friend, he wants me known as Bernie. So we call him Bernie. I said, what's going on, Bernie? And Bernie says to me, I don't know, Bill. I'm in the hospital. And the doctor comes to me and said, Bernie, I hate to tell you this, he said, you can have A or B. And Bernie says to the doctor, uh, what do you mean A or B? And the doctor thinks for a sec, he says, Bernie, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, let me ask you this question. If you had a choice between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, which one would you choose? Bernie, being a man of uh, means, and still with sound of mind, <clears throat> looks at the doctor and says, well, doc, I think I would rather have Parkinson's. And the doctor says, well, how did you come up with that conclusion, Bernie? He said, well, doc, I would rather spill my scotch than not be able to find the bottle. <laughs> so the fact of the matter is, he doesn't have an answer. He's given options. Now, doctors especially, we are in a dilemma with insurance companies. It's more of a negotiation now where you want to go. Here's your options, Mr. Patient.